I'm excited to have with us today three incredible aging experts. Um, we'll talk about how the experiences and lessons learned during your entire lifespan can impact how you deal with the challenges that come with aging. Um, we're also going to discuss how helping others has been found to be one of the best ways to decrease a sense of isolation and feelings of loneliness. And I'm also going to share some examples of programming that was implemented, implemented in our Senior Housing Network um, to combat social isolation during the pandemic. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our speakers today. Um, first of all is Bill Benson, and he's the president of Health Benefits ABCs and president of the International Association for Indigenous Aging. So Bill's an expert on aging and public health related policy. In his work, he focuses on strategic planning and evaluation services. His long career in the field of aging includes work at the US Congress and at the US Department of Health and Human Services. He spent a decade with the California Department of Aging and including as California's long-term care ombudsman. Until recently, he co-chaired the Public Policy Committee on the, for the American Society on Aging. And since 2000, Bill has hosted First Person, a series of conversations with Holocaust survivors. And we were pleased to have him join the B'nai B'rith podcast in the, in the past to discuss that aspect of his work. Also with us today is Gail, or, I'm sorry, Jill, Jill Switzer, Executive Director of NAMI New Orleans, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness in New Orleans. Um, Jill has extensive nonprofit and government leadership in experience in the areas of mental health advocacy, gun violence prevention, and civil rights. She is dedicated to ensuring that people living with mental illness and their families receive quality, accessible, and impactful mental health care. And also, we welcome Betty Tedesco. She's a licensed clinical social worker and certified care manager. Betty also sits on the board of NAMI New Orleans. She was co-founder and director for 25 years of home care solutions, providing geriatric care management, guardianship, and sitter and companion services. She's taught graduate coursework in gerontology as an adjunct professor at Tulane University School of Social Work. And you can read more about all of them in our um, leadership forum website. Um, and I just want to make sure everybody is aware that we are. I'm going to take uh, questions. Uh, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen has been enabled. So please, if you have questions while the sessions are going on, please feel free to send a question. At some of the breaks, um, I will read off the questions and hopefully we can get them answered for you. Um, so I wanna thank you all for being here today. And just a little bit about this session, we're first gonna talk about challenges, challenges in aging. Now we could spend days <laughs> talking about all the challenges there are, but we're gonna focus on, on a few with our experts. And then the second part, we're gonna talk about resiliency. So what is resiliency and how can we learn from these experts and from the life experiences of others and even reflecting on our own to create that resiliency in ourselves, whether we are the person that's currently aging, we all are, um, but that whether we're the, the older adults in our lives, um, we, have, we are caregivers for older adults and actually setting ourselves up for that um, resiliency as we age. So I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna give a brief description and then I'm just gonna turn it over to our experts and, and let them talk. So Bill, You've worked with people that have experienced extreme trauma, especially with your work with interviewing um, Holocaust survivors. Also with the International Association for Indigenous Aging, you're gonna talk a bit about that experience. And how I know you is actually, we work together because um, your company represents a few organizations that we work with through our housing. Um, the National Adult Protective Services Association, and ASK, which is the American Association of Service Coordinators. And um, Bill's been a great presenter working with our staff, our building staff trainings. So I really appreciate that he's going to talk about some of, of his experiences. 
and you're going to talk about those challenges. Um, then we're going to talk, we're going to um, go to Jill, and she's going to continue that discussion on aging and trauma, as well as some disaster related trauma. I think, you know, coming from New Orleans, she's going to share some personal experiences on that and what was learned and how we can help seniors and older adults in our lives um, through some of this. And then um, Betty's going to address cognitive decline, dementia, and family coping strategies and resources. And then I'll jump in at the end. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other challenges. I know Evan in his, his session also mentioned hearing, hearing aids and um, hearing loss, uh, vision, mobility. And I'm also going to talk from the perspective of our buildings. Um, I work with our residents. I work with the building staff. And also, I'm a caregiver and rapidly aging into um, older adult status as well. OK, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Bill. Thank you, Janelle, and also to Evan for including me as part of this discussion. I'm grateful to be able to participate in Vinay Brith's International's 2022 Leadership Forum. As Janelle noted, I have the privilege of working with Janelle, Evan, and Mark Olshan on housing issues facing older adults here in the U.S. And I just have to say from uh, my client, the American Association for Service Coordinators perspective, B'nai B'rith is our most important uh, pay partner in the work that we do around affordable housing. You've addressed truly important issues in your forum. It is noteworthy that you have included discussion about aging as much of the world, certainly the industrialized world, is witnessing the aging of their populations, the need to acknowledge the older adult population and recognize the challenges and realities accompanying the aging of nation's populations only grows in importance. According to the U.S. Census data released this past week by the federal government, the U.S. population age 65 plus represents 17% of the nation's population, at least in 2020, and will grow to 22% by 2040. It is already 21.3% in Florida and 21.8% in Maine. And the increases among those in the oldest cohorts of the elderly are even more striking. The age 75 to 84 group is now 21 times larger than it was in 1900. And the 85 and older group is now 54 times larger than in 1900. These are the older adults most likely to need the most support and use the most resources with huge implications for healthcare, housing, long-term services and supports and economic costs. These are also the older adults most vulnerable to developing Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, suffering from multiple chronic illnesses and being the victims of abuse, neglect and exploitation. The famed actor, Betty Davis, is frequently cited as the source of the oft quoted line, old age ain't for sissies. While it is disputed as to who first coined that phrase, I think most of us would agree with the sentiment. To reach old age is to have lived a long time and to have lived through a great deal. For many older adults, if not most, having lived many life experiences, no doubt includes a lot of unpleasantness, if not downright awfulness and likely trauma over the trajectory of their lives. For some, that trauma is experienced early in life, for others at late stages of life, and for others over the course of their lifetimes. According to the Center on Aging and Trauma at the Jewish Federations of North America, quote, 90% of adults in the US have been exposed to at least one traumatic event in their lifetimes, and exposure to multiple traumatic events throughout an individual's lifetime is common, end quote. My career has enabled me to work closely with populations of older adults who have experienced trauma in their lives and those who work closely with them. This includes serving, as Janelle noted, as a state long-term care ombudsman, investigating problems faced by residents of nursing homes and other long-term care-related group living environments, conducting interviews and conversations with Holocaust survivors over the past 22 years for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, working with the nation's state-based adult protective services systems that investigate reports of abuse, neglect, and exploitation, and working with American Indian and Alaska Native elders through our not-for-profit International Association for Indigenous Aging. 
Well, what do we know about these populations? Well, we know that Holocaust survivors have experienced almost unimaginable traumas, indeed horrors and profound loss, whether they survived concentration camps, were in hiding, or managed to otherwise escape the grasp of the Nazis and their fascist collaborators. For those who survived, they faced rebuilding their lives as best they could, often in new lands with very different cultures and languages. Concerns about their advancing age and increased frailties led to Congress authorizing funding for the Center on Aging and Trauma located with the Jewish Federations of North America to promote and support patient-centered trauma-informed care. This center has expanded beyond Holocaust survivors to address patient-centered trauma-informed care with other cohorts of older adults who have experienced or are experiencing trauma. We know that abuse, neglect, and exploitation of older adults and of people with disabilities is common. The most significant prevalence study of older abuse in the United States done to date suggests one in 10 older adults suffered at least one type of elder abuse in the past year. And 1.7% of older adults suffered multiple forms of abuse in a single year. One in 10 older adults abused in a single year. Think about that. The latest census report says there were 55.7 million people aged 65 and older in, the, in 2020 in the United States. One in 10 is more than 5.5 million victims. Reliable data also suggests that elder abuse is grossly underreported, with an estimated one in 24 incidents actually reported to appropriate authorities. And the disparity for financial exploitation is even greater with an estimated one in 44 reported to authorities. Beyond the assault, the blatant neglect, the loss of life savings due to a scam or other exploitation, research tells us that there are terrible outcomes for individuals, families, and communities, like increased hospitalizations, greater health care costs, mental health problems, suicidality, alcohol use, and premature mortality. For many Native Americans, apart from the litany of issues they face, such as huge health disparities, substance abuse, lack of access to adequate health care, domestic violence, and poverty, there is the impact of historical trauma defined by Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart of the University of Denver as the, quote, cumulative and collective emotional and psychological injury occurring over the lifespan and across generations resulting from devastating group experiences, end quote. As we noted in a brief that we prepared to accompany our webinar on historical trauma earlier this year, American Indians and Alaska Native people have a history littered with events that cause major emotional and psychological injury. Examples include the intentional introduction of new diseases, such as through smallpox, smallpox blankets, colonization, forced removal from homelands, and the existence of reservations and Indian boarding schools. The forced removal to boarding schools is fortunately getting considerable attention today. Dr. Ursula Running Bear of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe and a professor of population health at the University of North Dakota, who spoke at our webinar, focuses her research on the relationship of boarding school attendance and physical health. Her research shows that American Indian people who attended boarding schools exhibited more than three times greater odds of having cancer in the last year than those who did not. Historical trauma is, of course, not limited to our Native population. The legacy of slavery and racism, for example, is one of historical trauma. Many of those who've suffered traumatic events prove to be resilient people, either seemingly bouncing back from trauma or trudging ahead to survive the trauma or even thrive. I've had the privilege of working with a remarkable group of Holocaust survivors, so many of whom have now passed away. Collectively, those I've worked with are resilient. They've not only survived horrors too difficult to comprehend, but have led productive and full lives, giving to their communities, and indeed have and are thriving. But I know that there are countless Holocaust survivors who haven't had the same experience. It seems that we know too little about resiliency, especially for those who've suffered from trauma, which seems to be a significant group of older adults. The University of Arizona Center on Aging notes that, quote, the concept of resiliency in aging was born out of the paradox of old age. 
The paradox is that in spite of losses and physical declines experienced in later life, older adults report feeling content and they have lower rates of psychopathology than the general population, end quote. They go on to define resilience as the result of successful adaptation to adversity. And it is revealed by an individual's ability to cope and recover from crises, sustain a sense of purpose and vitality, and emerge stronger from stressful experiences. Resilience is a dynamic characteristic that may shift according to the circumstances. And they go on to say it can be manifest in many forms as an outcome of physical or mental recovery from a traumatic event, as a trait that describes an individual's enduring ability to cope, or as a process of recovering from a successful event and moving forward, stressful event and moving forward. No matter how resilience is viewed, the resources that lead to resilience can result in positive outcomes. In preparation for a workshop that I put together on Holocaust survivors and resiliency in their aging uh, for a conference, I found very little research about resiliency and Holocaust survivors. That may just reflect my poor research skills, but I didn't find much. The literature about resiliency and victims of abuse, neglect, and exploitation is also sparse, as is research about the relationship between early life abuse and abuse in later life. A promising area of research and study could be based upon the extensive and growing research and literature about adverse childhood experiences, or what we call ACEs. According to a paper about ACEs and cancer risk factors in adulthood, research on ACEs, quote, found that exposure to early adversity, especially in the absence of protective factors like a supportive family environment and social networks, can result in a host of harmful outcomes immediately and throughout the life course. And it further noted that, quote, while definitions vary, ACEs generally include child maltreatment, that is child abuse and neglect, and household challenges such as witnessing intimate partner violence, parental separation or divorce, mental illness or substance abuse in the household or parental incarceration that happened during the first 18 years of life. Moreover, exposure to ACEs has been linked to underdeveloped executive functioning and altered physiological stress responses, mental health problems, chronic health conditions, decreased life expectancy and other conditions. As my colleague, Dr. Marion Liu, a prominent elder abuse researcher at Purdue University said in a note to me about a few studies that have demonstrated a correlation between earlier abuse in life and elder abuse. Quote, the difficulty in this line of research is to demonstrate causality because longitudinal studies cost a lot. She shared with me, however, that she, what she thinks is the best study using secondary data to demonstrate the causal link this study by Eastern and Kong notes, quote, very little research has explored whether traumatic experiences occurring in childhood are related to the risk of abuse in late adulthood, like elder abuse. Some studies have examined the role of family violence and found that previous traumatic events like interpersonal or domestic violence or history of family violence and trauma or past abuse are predictors of elder abuse. But only a few studies have focused on the specific role played by adversities experienced in childhood. It seems to me that we need to learn more about the factors that contribute to resiliency for those who, who are experiencing normal aging, whatever that really is, but are experiencing the common vicissitudes of aging as one of my heroes, Dr. Arthur Fleming, the first secretary of HEW used to say, vicissitude is defined as quote, a change of circumstances or fortune typically one that is unwelcome or pleasant. Certainly much of that is part of aging, like the hip replacement that I face, or my increased difficulty driving at night, or my uh, declining hearing, uh, another important issue, and much more I know that is to come. But I think there's also a huge need to understand resiliency and its role in helping people to overcome, or at least to be able to continue to function reasonably well in response to trauma regardless of when it occurs over the lifespan and how often. The trend to provide patient-centered trauma-informed care in a variety of settings is a good one. More attention to helping people who've experienced trauma to recover and be able to move forward should also yield more insights about resiliency itself and what people can do to improve their own resiliency. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um... 
I guess we'll turn it over to, to Jill and Betty. Hi there. I'm Jill Switzer, and I am the new executive director of uh, NAMI New Orleans, and I'm so, so very thrilled to be here. I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, trauma and mental health and a, a example that's specific to my family, but certainly many of you, unfortunately, will recognize um, natural disaster and trauma with older adults. Um, we've already heard that trauma is um, increases the propensity for physical, mental, cognitive health. Uh, for example, a person's risk for depression, anxiety, cognitive dysfunction and deterioration are all a result of trauma when it's not handled appropriately or uh, resilience is not fostered. For older adults, um, the aftermath and the traumatic event have shown to be most difficult of any age group. My, um, the example that I have is about Katrina and my mother. Many of you across the country, across the world have experienced floods, wildfires, tornadoes. Uh, we've all experienced the pandemic, unfortunately, and other um, traumatic events. We all know older adults affected by those uh, events. My mother had chronic health conditions such as arthritis and high blood pressure when Katrina hit. She was in her early 80s and a lifelong resident of the New Orleans area. She also had experienced a significant trauma throughout her childhood and adulthood. One thing that uh, Bill mentioned is ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and she had certainly experienced some of that in her lifetime. Before Katrina, my mother and my aunt were living together in their own home. Here's just a few of the challenges that you can imagine or have experienced yourself. She evacuated and relocated to live with a sister in Missouri for nine months, Springfield, Missouri. If any of you have been there, it is dark and cloudy and it's colder than New Orleans. Um, my mother did not like the cold. She was physically cut off from friends. Uh, she had poor hearing and phone calls didn't work very well for her. She was not tech savvy. And so electronic communication was difficult and pretty much not existed. She was deeply concerned for family and friends. I'm the youngest of seven and five of my siblings lived in the New Orleans area and she was constantly concerned with how was their rebuilding going? Were they being safe in the midst of what became also a public health threat? <clears throat> High anxiety was definitely part of what she experienced. She was uh, disconnected from her place of worship that had been her place of worship for 80 something years. Um, when she returned, she moved in with my sister, another sister, again, six siblings. Um, she stopped driving and was not in her own home any longer. One thing that is probably not unique to New Orleans, but everybody here thinks it is, is that born and raised in New Orleans, it's almost a member of the family. Um, so it's not only um, immediate family, friends, neighborhood, but all the places that she, and schools that she had experienced all her life were greatly affected by the problems of Katrina. Um, one thing that I noticed that I looked up, I had heard this and I looked up the data is that those affected by um, Katrina, 71% of those who died as a result of Katrina were older than 60 years of age and nearly half were older than 75. If you didn't know enough about Katrina and the poor response, that statistic to me uh, highlights it. And of course, we all know that there's been a disproportionate impact on older adults from COVID for many reasons. So my mother experienced deep anxiety and depression, which she had not had in my lifetime. Um, one thing as a, as a lifetime mental health advocate, I have had to say repeatedly 
mental illness is not a part of normal aging. We have to take it seriously. We have interventions that work and we need to be aware of them and educate older adults. My mother was completely unwilling to seek treatment, including medication for her anxiety and depression. And that's another thing we all face with older adults is their autonomy. They get to make their health decisions. The onset and acceleration of dementia were also part of that cluster of traumatic events. Older adults in general, again, Katrina and my mother were not a specific, a situation that's unknown to many of us. Older adults, because of their chronic health conditions, significant disability, poverty, or lack of resources and social isolation, experience trauma and, uh, and its effects on their health at a higher rate than other age groups. Community organizations such as NAMI New Orleans and the many Jewish community organizations that are part of building strengths in families and older adults through supports and opportunities connect are what holds the fabric of our community together. As I went through this um, exercise of writing my notes and thinking about my mom, I remembered a number of things as we went along. And just this morning, I remembered the saddest part is her friend who had been her friend since college, so 60 something years, um, she died by suicide after Katrina. And it was certainly, she had had many challenges, but it was just the, the final factor. And of course that was very hard on my mom. So it's important to discuss resilience to prepare all age groups, but particularly older adults because of their vulnerability before a disaster comes. And Betty, who's gonna be next, who's a lovely member of our board, has some ideas about that. And I know we'll also discuss it after that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jill. Um, we do have um, somebody had a comment that they're hoping we can address. So um, while we're talking about some of this, I thought I'd, I'd read it out. Um, we can um, work on this because this is something, this is not unique. This is something that I, as a caregiver with my parents um, and as in our buildings, um, a key trauma experienced by a majority of older people is a loss of their spouse and the ongoing loss of friends. So um, something that we can keep in mind as we're talking about um, some of the challenges and then when we talk about some of the solutions along with resiliency, um, we can talk about that too and address it. But certainly that is something that um, every, every person that's aging experiences, especially the loss of, of their, their friends. Exactly, Janelle. Um, I will certainly keep that in mind. And as we saw, that certainly was a personal experience in Jill's family. How, how sad is that? Uh, thank you very much also for the opportunity to join you all in this conversation. And I'll just say at the outset that besides my social work, geriatric care management career, I also was the caregiver with my siblings, really mainly my sister, of my mother with 11 years of Alzheimer's care, which I always felt was very valuable in, in my work, very valuable to be able to, um, to have that personal experience to add to everything else I had learned. So uh, a little segue here, you know, whether triggered by the historic and severe situations uh, like natural disasters or the Holocaust or indigenous sources of trauma, we know that the physical and cognitive changes experienced as part of life and aging, uh, the health and mental health challenges can be crises in themselves. They become traumatic events. I do think that, you know, in my career, I certainly have seen that. Um, a poignant comment that I just heard this week kind of addresses this. You can't imagine what you lost so quickly. Said by a gentleman I know, a traumatized 73 year old man whose chronic spinal damage, disability and chronic severe pain has taken away his independence and created some care dependence that he is very worried he cannot afford financially into the future. 
So just that one, we're not talking about dementia or earlier trauma, but the trauma of losing your independence because of a chronic health issue. So as we know, getting into the segue of dementia, often dementia itself becomes a traumatic life change for both the person with cognitive decline and the family caregivers. Um, in a study published in October in JAMA Neurology, it's estimated that one in 10 US adults over 65 has dementia, while one in five has cognitive decline, a far more prevalent and common uh, development often which people fear will turn into dementia, but it doesn't always, as we know. Um, so it's estimated then that 6 million Americans, most over the age of 65, have dementia caused by Alzheimer's disease, and it's the seventh leading cause of death. Um, so what are the challenges of coping with cognitive decline and dementia? Well, the symptoms and realities are often pretty complex. Um, first of all, we know memory problems often are typically one of the first signs of cognitive impairment related to Alzheimer's disease. And gradual, unfortunately, brain-related functional losses often follow the cognitive changes. Uh, we know also, not to overlook this, there are multiple types of diagnoses of dementia that have been identified, including Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, basically multiple strokes, uh, and many, many other forms of dementia, some of which are reversible uh, if they are from temporary uh, medical causes. But some people have a condition called mild cognitive impairment with memory problems that may not interfere with their everyday life, and without maybe the progression of functional losses. But nevertheless, those, those declines of memory issues can certainly trigger social issues, isolation, fear, you know, by themselves without being a full-blown dementia symptom. They can be problematic and traumatic for the individual. So what are the changes and the impact of dementia? Well, you know, from my long social work experience with clients and families, and as I mentioned, my own uh, family members, um, we'll just look at, you know, some of the range of challenges. First of all, you know, fear of what was previously familiar, which really with many people turns into par paranoia. I mean, true paranoia. Um, this, you can see the progression of that. Um, social, you know, uh, symptoms, memory problems often trigger, trigger social withdrawal. Really, when you think about it, you know, withdrawing, having a smaller world, as one of the geriatric psychiatrists describes so well, uh, is a way of really coping with memory loss and confusion. Um, so socially withdrawing, um, helping to deal with their threatening sense of the world. Um, it's widely understood also that social us uh, being um, so so with, withdrawn often can lead to cognitive decline as well as emotional and psychological effects like depression, anxiety, loss of hope. So it really becomes almost a cycle of causes and effects. You know, which comes first, the cognitive changes or the behavioral responses that can create more difficulties in themselves. Um, it's been mentioned a little bit, Jill referred to this about her mother, but I have seen so many people with dementia with rigid, uncooperative behaviors. You know, the anger, the frustration, the belligerence, the, the defense mechanisms that are trying to protect them, but leading to rigidity. And we know that rigidity is not a resilient uh, uh, skill. It's the opposite of that. Uh, it really often leads to refusal of needed assistance. Even though a person may have lost significant functional abilities and have great risks to their personal safety, they often refuse the interventions. So the medication, the therapy, the the activity programs, et cetera. You know, so those, those are some of the most difficult changes and impacts of dementia. So what helps? What, what makes a difference? Well, it's important for a person coping with dementia to have a few strong anchors of emotional and concrete support. Um, how sad are those 
individuals who really kind of have no win uh, on our left to the, uh, you know, the staff in the assisted living or nursing facilities who really don't have that family connection. But the kind of concrete supports and services that do make a difference um, and, and include, can include new avenues for stimulation, support, and hope. For example, our family caregiver education to help families successfully set up care strategies at home. If we had more of that, it would be so different. Uh, if families had more support to understand how to do their home care. Um, also included in uh, good concrete support services, adult daycare programs, life learning, uh, lifelong learning programs, opportunities to volunteer, to socialize, to do for others, to practice being generous. Um, the whole idea of volunteering and being of help to others makes an enormous difference. Um, comment, during the pandemic, we know that many of my friends in their 80s, Zoom exercise classes, lectures, religious services online, and outreach by volunteers to keep connected made such a difference. Um, another very important thing that helps is continued access to healthcare support. This is so important. Too often, older adults and their families have great difficulty, especially since the pandemic, locating available healthcare professionals, neurologists, psychiatrists, other dementia specialists that can help to diagnose, treat, and help them to navigate the stages of care uh, that their loved ones are going through. I wanna mention the impact on families. I know I'm a little over my time, I'm so sorry. Um, when an adult, an older adult declines in independence, of course, the stress comes down onto their families. I wanna mention an excellent resource that I've found in the last many years, Dr. Leslie Kernison, K-E-R-N-I-S-E-N. -E -E She's a West Coast geriatric medicine specialist. Her website available to everyone is betterhealthwhileaging.net, betterhealthwhileaging. Her excellent points of families dealing with dementia include planning ahead, excellent idea, learn the basics of how dementia progresses, try to anticipate possible scenarios, and be straightforward about the realities of the future crisis and care needs. Think about what your loved one would want and what your family would want for them. Consider and discuss goals of care with your healthcare providers. Rather than curing or making major medical interventions, the focus may shift to comfort care and relief from pain and distress. And finally, consider options for legal, financial, and care planning. Face ahead of time the need for powers of attorney, financial management plans, a living will, and end-of-life decisions. So that's well covered in Dr. Leslie Kernison. I'll just refer you to her. Thank you. Look forward to answering any questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Betty. So I'm just going to mention real quick, um, there are some other challenges that we're not going to go into in depth, but, um, you know, the, some of the challenges are uh, hearing loss, vision loss, uh, mobility issues is a huge one. And um, again, that can cause the, the isolation um, and I think Betty, Jill, they've mentioned some solutions to that isolation as well, whether it's senior centers or um, if people decide to move to senior housing. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll make a plug for that in that uh, my parents during the pandemic did make that move. And um, there's a lot of supports in senior housing. It's not just housing, even if it's independent living, just like our um, housing network here with B'nai B'rith, uh, there's a lot of supports in there. There's even support groups for some of these um, cognitive issues uh, that Betty was mentioning. Um, and uh, I will mention that uh, my family alone is 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 dealing with with Parkinson's, which brings a whole host of neurological, whether it's cognitive or physical changes. And um, I I do think when we talk a little bit about resiliency, and I think the volunteerism is something I'm going to talk a little bit about too, is one of the things that can help when when someone has suffered a lot of loss, 
loss of spouse, loss of their friends. And uh, my dad's going to be 90 this week. Um, but it is his, so many of his contemporaries are gone. And um, there's the good part about living long. And there's that kind of part that, that maybe um, we have to figure out ways to support our family members. So um, just so you know, it's estimated that more than 50%, uh, actually it looks more like 54% of family members are caregivers. So that may be a spouse. I'm lucky that that my parents, even in their their golden years at 87 and about to be 90, are caregivers for each other. I am also part of that caregiver network, as well as my husband. Um, the rest of my siblings do not live nearby. So that's what we've put together along with the supports in, in the building that they're in. Um, but moving on, let's talk a little bit about resiliency in the few minutes that we have left. And I'm just going to give a real quick um, uh, definition from uh, the American Psychological Association. So resilience is the process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life experiences, especially through mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility and adjustment to external and internal demands. So a number of factors can contribute to how well people adapt to those adversities and the ways in which individuals view and engage with the world, the availability and quality of resources. This is all what we've been discussing and specific coping strategies. And I think um, that something was hit on edu educating, educating people, whether it's the medical field, um, the caregivers and the individuals themselves that um, some of these mental health challenges are not normal parts of aging and their supports to help um, cope with those, um, as well as um, not everybody that ages, not everybody that reaches 90 um, is going to be diagnosed with dementia. There may be some cognitive issues, but you can live independently with that. So it's not um, a sentence of that you will um, be needing 24 hour care the rest of your life either. But we wanna talk about how do we instill that in our lives, um, whether it's us we're concerned about in the aging process or our, our family members, because ultimately it's all gonna be about us anyhow. So. I've found a couple of great resources too. One is called whereyoulivematters.org. And um, we'll, we'll get these posted when we post the recording of some of these resources. But there's a connection of learning from experience. And so at Cornell University, they um, talk to people. What, what did they sharing their wisdom and advice gleaned from interviewing thousands of senior adults who'd su survived significant crises and gone to, on to enjoy um, productive, fulfilling lives. And a lot of these people had lived through events such as the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic, the Great Depression, that would be my parents, World War II, and the Holocaust. So what did they say helped them? Accepting that some things are out of your control and taking action on the things that you can control. Um, practicing self-care. Uh, that was a big thing, right? During the pandemic, we, we really uh, talked to the building staff and our buildings as well, taking care of yourselves. Um, there's that body, mind, um, soul connection that everything is connected. So if you're feeling lonely and isolated, it can actually affect your health as well. I think this is really good. Ask for help when you need it and look for the lessons that you can learn from the situation. So I'm going to share real briefly. I have been taking lots of um, webinars and classes to learn about um, ways to cope with dementia, with the pandemic, um, social isolation. And I participated in um, one session that it was put on by um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration. 
and it was called the Aging Virtual Social Engage Engagement Summit. And they had a professor from a Brigham Young University, and she reviewed 58 studies conducted during the pandemic on social isolation, social support, loneliness intervention for older adults. So they went through all this and, and the results, they, they did things like um, virtual visits, educational lessons on friendship, um, even robotic pets, um, any kind of virtual program they could do during the pandemic. And most of them, they really just didn't have the polling the participants afterwards. They just really weren't bringing that much to them. Um, didn't make them feel any more connected or less socially isolated. What they found was volunteering. Volunteering, getting involved, doing for others is ways that you can feel less lonely and less socially isolated, even if it's just a phone call, even if it's not that you're physically seeing that person, but just a virtual visit, but feeling that you are doing for another person was they felt the key to um, reduce the like the likelihood of loneliness, loneliness, especially during the pandemic, and that connection, the connection to somebody else. And anybody can do that, even with some um, cognitive decline, you can still make a phone call and see how people are doing. Um, and feeling good about that. And so in our buildings, we did a lot of um, using the residents as volunteers to distribute care packages, um, anything that they could get the residents to do something for each other um, was really helpful and keep kept people engaged. They did some fun activities too, decorating doors, surprise door decorating visits. Um, that everybody participated in because they felt they were doing something for somebody else and it made them feel good. So um, does anybody want to add anything or any questions? I know we're probably running a, a few minutes over time. Betty, did you have a comment? I had one comment about that. It, uh, what you described, Janelle, goes right to uh, the clubhouse model of many of the NAMI uh, regional uh, centers. Uh, the clubhouse model really uses uh, persons with mental health issues to really help run the clubhouse, to assist with transportation, with uh, job contacts, with training. It's a really part of running the clubhouse and being useful. Not, not make work, but actually uh, work related to developing community. So it certainly is used in the mental health field, and we hope to do that uh, on a larger scale in New Orleans. Great. Any other comments? Two, two comments from uh, Janelle. Um, one, I think John Locke got it right. No man is an island. And so the notion that we can, or woman, uh, the notion that we can you know, have that, that internal grit that'll get us through anything. There are people like that, but they're very rare. We need others. And I think that the whole notion of social connectedness um, in good times and in bid, bad times is absolutely essential. And so I think that as we learn more about social connections and create opportunities for people to connect, uh, we are going to be serving people to become more resilient over time. And I think it's especially important that we figure out how to do that for populations that are isolated and not living in congregate or you know nice neighborhoods or communities uh, where they have those opportunities to do that. Um, the the other thing I'll just comment, and I I don't have a great deal of knowledge about it, but uh, there is fortunately finally a great deal of attention being paid to mental health and aging in a way that we've not seen before, and there is legislation. Uh, being worked on in the Senate on a bipartisan basis that actually most people believe has a chance to even potentially get through in the last few days of this Congress, but if not, uh, something to be hopeful about next year to finally address mental health and aging and more importantly, put resources into it. Great. Thank you. Well, um, this has been a really terrific discussion, um, and I really want to thank all of our guests and to all of the people that are watching. Um, thank you so much.